Keith Humphreys is a professor in the department and the Esther Ting Memorial Professor uh, in the department and has done really worldwide impact uh, work in uh, addiction and addiction policy. And Anna Lemke is an associate professor in the department, a psychiatrist and program leader, has just written an amazing book called Drug Dealer MD that's made every chart possible and has podcasts. Uh, Terry Gross interviewed. Uh, it was just amazing. And so I've asked them to talk with us a little bit about the impact we can have in addressing addiction. OK, thank you. Hello, everybody. I applaud your endurance. Uh, at moments like these, when I'm at the very end of such an incredible conference, I completely identify with Larry Fortensky, if you know who that is. Uh, he was Elizabeth Taylor's eighth husband. <laughs> and I think about that moment, poor Larry, the wedding ceremony's over, and he's walking to the honeymoon suite, and he has to be thinking, I know it's expected of me, but I hope no one thinks I do it better than all the other people who got here before I did. <laughs> so here we are to round up your day uh, to talk about addiction. And specifically what we're going to talk about is the opioid epidemic. I don't need to tell you anything about it. You all read the papers. but just you know, the, the, the scale of it historically is really worth considering. It is the worst opioid epidemic in the history of our country. It is more lethal than AIDS. It is more lethal than any epidemic we've had actually since the influenza outbreak of the 1950s. Since this century started, more Americans have died of drug overdose than died in World War I and World War II combined. So if we're going to make progress on this epidemic, lots of things are going to be needed. But part of what's going to be needed is terrific science and terrific technology. But what we want to talk about is the translation of that science from academia into action. Because without the translation, it, nothing happens. And you know, a great example of that is you know, a trivia question, how many lives were saved by the stethoscope in the decade after it was invented? Do you know the answer? None, because no doctor used a stethoscope um, for almost a whole generation. So unless something is done to actively translate, and this is a process that in academic science we tend to undervalue and under-resource, we're not going to get an impact. So what we're going to do, we're going to talk about two different parts of this. I'm going to talk about how you translate this into the world of public policy. And then Anna will talk about how do you translate this into the training of people who take care of patients, uh, both take care of addicted patients, but also how, uh, teaching people how to prescribe in a way that you don't necessarily uh, face the risk of creating iatrogenic addiction. So in, in terms of the public policy space, we, I would say two very broad things we're doing, to say networks and capacity. So. Um, if you, uh, you, whatever you do, if you're a scientist or you're, you're, you're an entrepreneur or a venture capitalist or whatever, you do not have a problem of lack of information. That is, that is not our world's problem. The problem is too much information. When I worked in the White House, I had access to the Library of Congress, which is the best li library in the world. They have everything. I never asked them for anything because I never needed more information. What I needed to know is out of the explosion of information shooting at me at all times of the day, what is gold and what is garbage? And how do you figure that out in your life? Well, if you're like most people, you do it through networks. You start to learn, I trust that person. I know they give good information. I don't trust that person. I think they give bad information. And that's a, how we sort between the gazillions of things that come at us and paper and the phone and the email and the Twitter and all that sort of stuff. So it's not going to work. You know, if you're, you're a scientist, you publish a terrific new study about addiction treatment, even if it's in Nature or New England Journal of Medicine, that is not inherently going to be taken up by a policymaker and say, turn into a new program to provide that treatment unless there's a network. So one of the important things we're doing, I'm really excited about, is we've created a network. It's called the Stanford Network on Addiction and Policy, SNAP. I was up all night thinking of that. Um, and it brings together the core group is about 15 people, roughly evenly split between scientists here and people who actually hold positions in public policy. Scientists are drawn heavily from neuroscience. We have some people who do more behavioral work on addiction, as well as uh, at least one expert is from the, the law school who focuses on cannabis policy. And then the policymakers range from all sorts of people. We have the mayor, uh, Steve Williams, who's the mayor of uh, Huntington, West Virginia, the town with the highest overdose rate in the entire country. Uh, we have a state Supreme Court justice, a chair of the uh, health committee in the California Assembly, advisors to governors and things of that sort. 
And we, we get together and it's a great opportunity to educate each other. Uh, some scientists think what's going to happen when they meet policymakers is policymakers will sit at their feet, learn the science and, 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 and so on. But wh uh, what they don't realize until they meet policy people is policy people tend to be very smart too. They just have a different knowledge base and they, they can explain things to scientists that scientists are mystified by. Why do certain uh, scientific findings get used and other ones get completely ignored? How is it, why do we have a budget and what is it uh, that constrains us? What can you do in the law and what can't you do? What is actually controlled more in the culture and can't necessarily be legislated? So it's a really dynamic interaction and, and the other point that's really good is it creates that network of trust. So that the, the person who's sitting in Sacramento knows, you know, there's a new bill that, you know, we're going to cover naltrexone in, in Medi-Cal. What is naltrexone? That they can call up someone they know, you know, they know is good from Stanford or, or somewhere else in the network and say, what is this? You know, does it work? Will it help people? Um, you know, or we've got a new bill to arrest people for heroin and put them in prison for a year. Will that make them stop? Why or why not? And you know, we know the answers to these questions, but this is a way for us to get it out. So that, that's one of the big things, the network. The other part to it is that we all know the people we know, but we don't know all the people that the people we know know. I think I said that right. Um, and uh, that, that means there are doors open when you sort of bring these worlds together. So for me, uh, Monday, I'm gonna be in the House of Commons in London with one of the members of our network, and we're gonna uh, present on how they can handle alcohol-involved uh, crime, of which they have quite a bit. There's, there's ways to handle people who have drinking problems and done something violent where you can keep them out of prison, but you also uh, can uh, protect public safety and uh, help them drink less. And you know, that's jumping the pond entirely through this network that happens to be one of the members of the network, was an advisor to the British government and helped set that up for us. The other thing we're doing is trying to build capacity at Stanford, just the skills for people to do this translation. Um, anytime I give a talk on policy at Stanford, people come up and they want to be engaged. This is a very uh, social activism, uh, uh, you know, policy-minded campus. They might be students, they might be uh, staff, they might be professors, um, but we don't have a public policy school and they don't exactly know where to go. So we've been trying to create opportunities for them to learn the things they would learn if there was a public policy school to teach them. Things like, um, how do you write testimony to a committee anyway? And um, why is it that um, you know, a terrific scientific finding on you know, uh, saving people from overdose is get, not getting any attention, and yet some other finding on something that doesn't work seems to be commanding everyone's uh, a mind? How do you talk to a reporter? Uh, we had a wonderful uh, class experience with Jill Lawrence, who's the um, uh, uh, chief editor at USA Today's uh, uh, op-ed page. She, she and I and, uh, and Paul Costello, who runs media here, just training scientists on how do you take what you know and put it in, in that journalistic format that has coverage you know, beyond anything we can attain through our journals. And it's, journalism writing is extremely different than science writing, but it is a learnable skill that can be taught. And so we're, we're, we're doing that so that more people, whether it's in the area of addiction or not, can take the work they do here and the terrific things they find and then move them into the policy arena. The last thing I want to say about this is we do try to teach everybody is there is a difference between science and advocacy. And particularly when we get very passionate about things, you know, it's easy to think that because we're scientists, every, every political opinion we have must be scientifically validated. But of course, that's not true. I have plenty of opinions that have nothing to do with science. They're just my opinions. And there's some learning that goes on for, for people to realize the world would not be better if it were run by scientists. Uh, have you been to a faculty meeting? I mean, I, this is, should not be a hard thesis to defend, right? So that's not our place. No one voted for us. It's not for say, I found this, therefore the world must live the way I want. But it is our place to say, I know there's many things that have to go into policy. There's people's values. There's voting. There's the kind of country we want to live in. Um, but also that some of these matters are empirical. Some treatments for addiction work. Other ones do not. Some ways of regulating healthcare create a lot of uh, iatrogenic addiction. Other, other ways prevent it. And we know these things. We have to get them out there. We're responsible to do that. And so that's what we're focusing on these, in these policy translation initiatives. So I'm going to turn it over now to, to Anna to talk about how we're trying to translate the same kinds of things into how we uh, train our healthcare professionals. Thanks, Keith. Um, I want to start by thanking my table. We've been together since 8 o'clock this morning, and I feel like we've been together for a lifetime. Thank you. Um, I've learned a lot today, a lot of great brain pictures. I'm, waking, I'm waiting for the Philip Alveda brain jewelry line to come out. Anybody else want that, those beautiful? Yeah, right. Um, okay, 
So the opioid epidemic is first and foremost an epidemic of overprescribing. That came about because physicians got the wrong kind of education about opioids and because we didn't get any education about what is addiction. Um, when I went to medical school and I went to Stanford, I didn't learn anything about addiction. When I went through my psychiatry residency here at Stanford, a great place and a great training, I didn't learn anything about addiction. So the silver lining of this tragic epidemic is that uh, we are now getting some interest in teaching addiction. I was really excited to hear Tom Cleo mention that this space where we can educate or translate a brain science uh, to others through education is a relatively ignored space. And I think that's really true. There's a huge opportunity here to educate physicians, to educate consumers. I can tell you that when I'm treating patients and I'm trying to motivate them to change their behavior and I treat addiction, um, I get a lot more traction when I start to invoke the neuroscience, right? When I say, well, you know, the neuroscience has shown us X, Y, or Z, people tend to get motivated. So I'm going to take the little bit of time that I have and just kind of give you an example of the way that I think we need to sort of chunk neuroscience in a way that's digestible for the average consumer so they can use it to inform their decisions in their lives. Basically, what I do is I say, when I'm trying to uh, treat my, my patients with addiction, I said, imagine that uh, in your brain is a balance. And basically, this is the balance that processes pain and pleasure. When the balance gets tipped to one side, you experience pleasure. When it gets to the other side, you experience pain. I really like chocolate, so when I eat a piece of chocolate, that tips my balance slightly to the side of pleasure. I get a little dopamine release, yay, right? The big difference between an addictive drug and a non-addictive drug is the amount of dopamine that's released and how quickly it's released. So when I get Vicodin from my doctor and opioid for pain, I don't get a little tip of the balance. I get a great big tip and it goes down very quickly. If I crush and snort that pill, it goes even faster, a lot of dopamine. That's why it's addictive. So there are some important rules governing this pleasure pain balance. And one of them is that the balance wants to stay level. It doesn't want to be tipped to the side of pleasure or to the side of pain. So therefore, when I have a pleasurable experience and I tip over here, there's a process called neuroadaptation. Imagine that like a little gremlin hopping on the pain side that brings my balance level again. But the gremlin likes to be on the balance. He doesn't get off right away. So then I tip a little bit to the side of pain. And that's that moment of wanting that second piece of chocolate. If I wait long enough, the gremlin hops off. My balance is level again. But imagine now I took some Vicodin for a knee injury. I don't get a little tip. I get a great big tip. In order to bring my balance level again, I need a great big gremlin. So then I get the come down. That's the opioid withdrawal. It lasts maybe days to weeks. The gremlin gets off and my balance is level again. To understand the disease of addiction, this chronic relapsing and remitting disorder, is to understand that if I take opioids for days to weeks to months to years, I'm basically at war with my neuroadaptation gremlins, right? I've got more and more opioids. I've got more and more gremlins trying to bring my balance level again. That's me downregulating my own dopamine, downregulating my own endogenous dopamine receptors, so that if I want to stop using, what happens is I'm not level again. I crash down to the side of pain because those gremlins hang around for a long time. That means I'm walking around like this in pain. And it doesn't last just the days or hours of opioid withdrawal. It lasts weeks to months to years. And that is why people with addiction will relapse to their drug use even after they've got their lives back, they've got their wives back, everything's better. They still will use because they're not at a level homeostasis kind of a place. They're walking around in, in a dysphoric kind of a place. Buprenorphine. Buprenorphine is an opioid that we use to treat opioid addiction. It goes against all instincts that we would use an opioid to treat an opioid addiction. But multiple placebo-controlled trials across countries, across continents, shows that it works, it improves lives. Imagine the balance, OK? If somebody's walking around like this, and we give them buprenorphine, what does it do? It brings the balance level again, right? It allows people to re-engage in their lives, to re-engage in the recovery work, to go to Narcotics Anonymous. People who have been addicted to heroin don't get high on buprenorphine. It brings the balance level again, because buprenorphine is a unique opioid with unique properties. And in closing, I'm going to teach you all the buprenorphine dance which hopefully will allow you to remember what is unique 
about buprenorphine. What? Buprenorphine. Sorry. So buprenorphine plus naloxone. The trade name is Suboxone, and it's a it's an opioid that treats opioid use disorder. Methadone is another opioid that treats opioid use disorder. So anybody, everybody, stand up. We're gonna we're gonna end with the buprenorphine dance here. Okay. Why does buprenorphine work for opioid use, or use disorder? Three reasons. The first reason, it has a very long half-life. So stretch your arms out, it has a very long half-life. Very good. Why is the long half-life important when you're treating addiction? Because it takes us out of this cycle of intoxication, withdrawal, drug seeking, intoxication, withdrawal, drug seeking. All right, so great, 36 hour half-life. I can get a steady state. What else is awesome about buprenorphine? It's really hard to overdose and kill yourself. Why? Because there's a ceiling effect on respiration. Most other opioids suppress cardiac rate, they suppress breathing rate. So, you know, you go to sleep and you don't wake up again. Buprenorphine doesn't do that. There's a ceiling effect on respiration. Finally, buprenorphine has a really tight binding affinity in the opioid receptor. Here's the opioid receptor. Here's buprenorphine. Imagine you've got heroin in there. Buprenorphine comes in, knocks that out, and it stays in there really tightly. Turn to your partner. One of you be buprenorphine receptor, the other one be buprenorphine. Now, don't let your partner let him go. Don't let him go. Hold it really tightly. Shake their hand and don't let it go. All right. You guys are awesome. In closing, we're going to do the buprenorphine dance. Ready? One, two, three. It's got a long half life, it's got a ceiling effect on respiration, it's got a tight binding affinity. Thank you so much.